Tonight we're going to wrap up our special series looking at the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. The big question we wanted to answer, has it worked? Like so many issues and potential solutions in our communities, it really depends on who you ask. So tonight, we're going to feature many of your thoughts. And in quite the coincidence, late this week there's been some big developing news on two of the topics that we covered. It's our big story tonight. Environmental reporter Cale Williams joins us and Cale, here's a breakdown of the stories that you brought to us this week. So let's start with the northern spotted owl. What is your biggest takeaway there? You know, I was struck by how the threats to the spotted owl, they've really changed over time. When they were first listed, it was primarily habitat loss from logging. But now you've got the barred owl that's moving into its territory. And it really just kind of shows you that these things are not static. They change over time. And so our conservation strategies, they've got to change with them. Here's what viewers had to say. First, Cindy wanted to know why wildfires weren't more prominently featured when it comes to the owl's habitat loss, writing, I'm curious why the wildfires were not mentioned as a result of the lack of forest management. Some of the worst environmental issues have been from the smoke pollution from the wildfires. If our foresters could thin the trees, the threat of wildfires would diminish. You know, Cindy has a point. Wildfire definitely fits into the habitat loss category of threats to the spotted owl. But all of these things are connected. You know, old growth forests store carbon dioxide. So when they disappear, whether from wildfire or from logging, that makes climate change worse, which makes catastrophic wildfires more likely. And before we move on, we wanted to share this little coincidence from Linda. She told us Monday night after watching the story in your piece about the spotted owl, my husband and I heard a loud whack against the house. We went to investigate and found an owl, we think a spotted owl, had flown into our front door glass. Here's a look at a couple of photos she sent us. Her message went on. It was stunned and didn't move for about an hour. We could tell it was breathing, so we left it alone. I then sat, it then sat up and eventually turned its head and looked right at me. About two hours later, it flew away, thank goodness. A spotted owl and its larger relative, the barred owl, look very similar, so we're not sure if this is a spotted owl or not, but thanks so much for sending these in, Linda. Now let's move on to Tuesday's story about the gray wolf and their resurgence in eastern Oregon, with some packs spreading west and southwest as well. Your story focused on both the rancher side of this and the advocate side of this, with people who want to see more done to help the wolves thrive. Ranchers, of course, are obviously not thrilled with their return because of attacks on livestock. The biggest takeaway for you on this one, Kale. You know, it was curious to me how, just like the owls, these things change over time. When wolves first came back, the situation in eastern Oregon was really volatile. But it seems like tempers have cooled a bit, and it seems to follow that pattern. You know, it's a big issue when wolves first show up, and then things settle down as people get more used to their presence. And you're seeing that play out in Colorado as we speak. Voters there decided wolves should come back, and Oregon plans to send up to 10 of our wolves for reintroduction in Gunnison County. But a group of livestock producers out there sued to block the plan, and a judge is scheduled to decide today if it can move forward. Depending on how the judge rules, wolves could be released there as soon as next week. Wow, just today. And we heard from our one rancher on our YouTube page who actually sounds like he's thankful for the wolves, writing, Coyotes are much harder on my calves than the wolves. Yet since the wolves have resurfaced, the number of coyotes I'm dealing with has dropped drastically. I also find that between my dogs and all the other things I have added to scare the wolves away, I'm definitely not losing as many calves as I used to. I'm also not spending all my time dealing with coyotes. And we heard that the biggest issue for the ranchers out there is obviously the financial toll that comes when wolves attack and kill livestock. But a viewer named Jeff called in with an idea that he thinks would help. A pretty simple solution. Let's just find a way from the legislature to set aside $1 million per year to pay the farmers for validated claims of livestock loss. $1 million a year. It's the same price as a Portland Hills home. Is it that difficult? $1 million a year, set it aside, pay the farmers, especially the gentleman in your story, and then get on with letting the wolves thrive. This is where they belong. We should be blessed that they're amongst us. Why are we trying to export this to Colorado? Makes no sense whatsoever. Kill, you have some numbers from the state on just how much money has been paid out. 
I do. You know, last year the state paid out almost $400,000, but not all of that was to compensate ranchers for dead cows. This graph from the Oregon Department of Agriculture shows how much money ranchers have requested in blue compared to how much they were actually given in yellow. The counties are the ones who pay the ranchers through a grant program that receives some taxpayer funding from the state's general fund. Almost three quarters of that money was paid out for pre prevention though. And that's things like electric fencing, cattle dogs, and other things that are meant to deter wolf attacks. All right, now let's move on to the big one, Pacific salmon, if you will. And this is where we got a bit of surprise this week from the Biden administration regarding the lower Snake River dams. What's developing out there, Kel? Yeah, so this has been a long time coming. The first lawsuit over the dams is more than 20 years old. And just yesterday, the federal government released a plan that appears to lay the groundwork for removing the dams. The agreement, which is between Oregon, Washington, and four tribes in the area, has roughly a billion dollars that would fund habitat restoration work and hatcheries. And it also has money for tribes to start working on renewable energy projects. That's important because those would offset the hydropower that would potentially be lost if the dams are taken out. Now, there are a bunch of folks who aren't happy about the plan, though, and critics say the deal was crafted in secret. It doesn't address other important factors like irrigation and river navigation. And the plan doesn't guarantee the dams would absolutely be breached at all. That kind of thing would require action from Congress. So I think that while this is a, the biggest move we've seen in a long time, it's going to take some time to see how this all shakes out. What a coincidence. We saw that just happen this week while we're talking about all this. We also heard from a few viewers with ideas on how to boost salmon runs, at least only in Columbia. Greg wrote to us, there needs to be a discussion on gill netting. All gill netting needs to end immediately. ODFW and WDFW need commissioners who are appointed who end gill netting. And Blaine said, the Columbia River gill net fishery is one of the last gill net fisheries that remains legal in the world. I believe banning gill nets on the river will also help salmon recovery. So, Kale, explain to us what gill netting is. Sure. So gill nets are basically netting that hangs in the water column. It's got very specific sized mesh that's meant to only catch fish of certain sizes. People who use them say the sizing of the holes makes it possible to only target specific species. But critics say you can't really target a species, just a size of fish. And lots of folks have been arguing, like our viewers here, that they should be outlawed. And there's one more aspect of this salmon story that deserves some mention tonight that many of you wrote in about. Let's let a viewer named Mark explain. How about the sea lions that gang up around the salmon as they're going up towards various dam ladders and just take bites and the rest of the fish floats away. They don't eat, obviously, efficiently like you and I. There are more times that we've saved the sea lions and seals than worried about the salmon. Let's kill a few sea lions and see how the habitat recovers for the Pacific salmon. Yeah, you know, Mark isn't wrong. You know, I've seen sea lions at Willamette Falls just gorging themselves on salmon. I've been there myself. I've seen it with my own eyes. But the state hasn't just been letting it happen. More than 350 sea lions have been killed at Willamette Falls and the Bonneville Dam since 2008, with almost 50 this year. And there's evidence it's helping. At Willamette Falls, they counted just 822 winter steelhead in 2017. That is a very low number. They started killing sea lions there the following year and saw a four-fold increase in steelhead within just a few years. And last night you gave us a wider view, that kind of 10,000-foot level on the Endangered Species Act, detailing some of the successes and the struggles over the last five de decades. And you heard a variety of responses from experts and people you talked to on whether the act has been successful. What do you think is the biggest takeaway in all of this from what you've heard? You know, I think it really depends on how you define success. It has been successful in keeping a lot of these species from going extinct, which by the letter of the law is what it was intended to do. But with some exceptions, like the bald eagle, it hasn't been nearly as successful at recovering these species to robust, sustainable populations, which is what I think a lot of people assume is the point. And we talked earlier this week about this email from a viewer named Darren. One of my environmental science professors was part of the group that Bill Clinton formed to come up with proposals to protect, to protect the spotted owl. The plans for the most part centered on protecting salmon. If the things needed to protect the salmon were addressed, the spotted owl problem would take care of itself. Your coverage so far has implied that these are all separate issues. They are not. Gail? You know, I think Darren has a point. There there is a lot of crossover between salmon and owls, especially when it comes to old growth conservation. But I think the biggest connector across a lot of endangered species is climate change. It's wildfire with owls, it's water temperatures with salmon. It really is one, of, one problem that cuts across almost all endangered species.
And finally, we've arrived to tonight's segment with all this great viewer reaction that we've received throughout the week. And while there's not a silver bullet to help all of these endangered species at one time, a few viewers shared this sentiment from a viewer named Dan. On the series of the fishing and animals and all, Mother Nature was doing very well before we intervened. George wrote to us, the one subject that few people talk about is the growing human population. We are the real problem. The global human population reached 8 billion mid-November 2022 from an estimated 2.5 billion people in 1950, adding a billion people since 2010 and 2 billion since 1998. Kale? Yeah, you know, that is a common thread through many of these stories. Human-caused issues are what are causing a lot of these problems. There's a finite amount of space and resources on the planet, and the more our numbers grow, the more space and resources we need. But as I said yesterday, humans have exacerbated many of these environmental issues. And that means we also have the power to fix them. And that just comes down to the willingness of humans to actually make that happen, correct? It's really a matter of willpower. Well said. Well, before we go tonight, I wanted to share some of the praise that viewers sent in this week for your work and for the work of our photojournalists, producers, and team. DJ wrote, thank you, the story crew and Kale, especially for this week's excellent reporting. I'm a thousand percent bullish on owls, old growth, wolves, and salmon. We should do everything we can to protect, preserve, assist, and increase these valuable gifts of our creator and mother nature. This is what makes Oregon special, magical, and forever wild. Thank you for these stories and for bringing us native voices. I am calling just to express gratitude for the story, the series, and I've been watching all week about environmental northwest stories um, some of the information i have already known but i just think it's fantastic what you're doing the way you're doing it the tone and i like all of the reporters for all of the stories so thank you very much it's uh, really informative and useful and inspiring and i'm really glad that I'm watching it. Thank you very much. Well, goodness. Thank you, Sarah. And we'll end on this from Nancy. I'm a regular viewer. Series like this one on endangered species are so important for understanding within the community. Balanced reporting, reporter expertise. They provide excellent threads through these topics over time. Thanks to all of you involved in delivery and production. And a sincere thanks to all of you for sharing your thoughts with us this week. We really mean that. The story just isn't the story without you. Kale, any final thoughts as we wrap up the series here? I mean, I would just echo those sentiments. You know, I'm really thankful for everyone who's watched, everyone who called in, everyone who wrote in, all the feedback. And I want to send a special thank you to uh, the main photographer that I worked with on this series, Kurt Austin. Root guy is really a wizard behind the camera. He put in a lot of long days, long hours shooting and editing this thing, and none of it would be possible without him. We're so thankful to our photojournalists doing a lot of great work and bringing the visuals that you see every night. If you missed any of Kill's stories this week, you can catch up by streaming our Endangered Northwest special on Roku, Fire TV, or Apple TV. Just download the free KGW Plus app. You can also watch the special right now over on the KGW YouTube channel.